No problem. Good evening, everybody who is on the call this evening, and uh, welcome to those of you joining on our YouTube channel, which I'm sure will um, outnumber the 40, 50 of us that are here tonight. Great to see um, so many here tonight. Um, it's good and very timely that we've got um, Chris Stainout with us this evening from the International Meteor Organization. Um, some of you may be aware that there is a new um, meteor project underway in the UK. Um, there's, a, there's a team of enthusiasts putting a beacon together for uh, uh, a 50 megahertz. And the application is into Ofcom at the moment to get the regulation uh, the, uh, license sorted out. So keep a, keep a watch on that, especially if you're interested in uh, forward scatter observations. Anyway, um, enough of me. Uh, our time this evening in, in the main will be a presentation from Chris uh, from the IMO. Following that, there's um, a, a couple of members who have um, some work and observations to share. So just now, Chris, it's over to you. Thanks, Paul. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. I'm not sure if there's a lot that's happening. You see this one? It's looking good. I put this to full size. Yes. And start it. Start the slideshow. Is this now full screen, just the title page? I think, it, yes, it is, yes. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. It's also my pleasure. More than 40, that's quite an audience, and still many more offline. Um, yes, I'm currently the IMO Radio Commission Director, not so long after uh, Jean-Louis Roll, who had to leave because of health problems. But I have a long history in our Belgian scene about radio meteors, so you will hear that more than once. Um, let me first introduce you IMO. That was founded already back in 1988. Currently, there are some 250 members. Most of course, like you can guess in, in Europe, uh, North America, Japan, like I guess with many of these activities. And not just amateurs, but there are also few professionals. There are not that many, and some even started out their careers as uh, amateurs. When I speak about, for instance, Peter Janiskens, uh, he did definitely. Right. Um, it is an international non-profit organization according to the Belgian law. Apparently, there's here a, a good law because uh, many more organizations are using that one. For instance, the International Astronomical Union has also their uh, laws here and uh, already for 100 years. Um, it's a full organization with the council, with the board of directors. The main activities are still editing the bi-monthly magazine, which you can have on paper or electronically. Uh, and also in, very important are the yearly meteor congress of the IMCs. Um, fortunately, hopefully this year in Hungary, already postponed two years in a row for the well-known reasons. Uh, but it does happen every year. Uh, otherwise, I skip a few. Uh, it's always attached to some, some visit like the one in 2014 to CERN in Geneva. And actually, we got back one in 2010 in Armagh. That was the first one I attended after long absence. There are working groups, call it, call it commissions, visual work, video, photographic, radio, fireballs, fireball reporting, radio, of course, is the smallest one. Uh, photographic and video is, is far more spectacular, of course. But OK, you choose your uh, subject and you go on with it. Um, also, every 
maybe four or five years, they run at the occasion of the IMC a radiometer school. That's a, a day extra. Uh, can say this is very theoretical, more the physics behind that, not, not so much the practical things. Let me switch to quickly to the IMO. Uh, let me see how we can do that. The IMO webpage, you can of course uh, look at that yourself. There you will see coming back most of the things I said with recent news, all the working groups, all the various topics. So um, there you can have a look. Meet your scatter principle, I think I don't have to explain, but still I do again. This is a drawing from my friend Pierre Tarré, French guy, who uh, showed it here. You have a transmitter, broadcast waves. You have a meteor under the right angle, and you have a receiving antenna that picks up the reflected image. So there is no direct connection between the transmitter and the receiver. Otherwise, you have a permanent signal. You can you cannot do anything with that. Only for meters under the right angle, and I stress that you do have reflections. It's also not the proper emission or uh, radiation from the meteor itself. This is much too weak. There is some, but it's much too weak at the uh, wavelengths where we do work. So we said that already. Um, normally, we should observe that at as, as wavelengths as long as possible, because the received power is proportional to the third of the wavelength and the duration of the reflection to the square. Now, that, of course, has practical limitations, of course, uh, both in terms of uh, size of the antenna, but also of, of available bands where you can do some of that stuff. Let me go back first to some history. Um, that forward scatter that we just described basically was the uh, found or discovered by Hay and Stewart in the UK just after the Second World War with a radar uh, also. Um, and also during the war already, they had got very strange signals that they could not really pinpoint down to planes or to other events. And for instance, in, in the period of the month of June, they got many of these signals. Came then a couple of years later, Prentice Lovell, that's Sir Barnard Lovell of uh, Churchill Bank indeed, uh, did also an experiment with three stations in Kent and Essex, uh, some tens of kilometers apart. Uh, the receiving antennas were just dipoles on, and 73 megahertz was the frequency. And there they got a conclusive link with the ether accurate stream in 47. Also the signals they got in June, uh, that are daylight streams that uh, might be non-theoretically, but of course nobody could see them. So that's the discovery of the Hay and Stewart of the daytime streams, and we will come back to that one too. What did we do as amateurs uh, 20, 30 years ago? Uh, we could use the FM band, 88 to 108 megahertz, of course, you, this band is, is full. It's reused several times. It's for local use. So this is not really very practical uh, in densely populated uh, yeah, places like here, the Western Europe, Europe, Europe UK, and so on. Um, you could do something, for instance, in the TV band, 45 megahertz. That sometimes happened. That's also pretty big. But then we got uh, here the unique uh, situation that the so-called East Bloc uh, under the influence sphere of, of Russia, starting from East Germany, Czech, and so on, used an, a different uh, band for FM, 66 to 72 megahertz, which was not used in the, the Western Europe. So that was an opportunity to listen to these uh, uh, powerful stations. Um, like we all know, they disappeared. Uh, and then it's time, of course, for some alternatives. Um, yeah, if you have no, if, if just the FM band there, then yeah, you have the same problem. 
Um, coming back to here, uh, the beacons that we were able to put here in Belgium, and you here, and I knew you were working on that one. So I will elaborate a bit on this. Um, we managed to get one at 49.99 megahertz, 50 watts uh, Ypres, so in the west of Belgium, and a second one, uh, 49.7, 200 watt. Where are these frequencies coming from? Well, the amateur band starts at 50 megahertz. And there's no way that we would be allowed to put in there a beacon in the amateur band. This is also very crowded and is used for transmission. So no good in that one. Um, but we were very lucky that one of our members is, uh, is working with the regulator, the Belgian Institute of Post and Telecommunications. And he was able to approve us uh, that license. Um, of course, under the, con circum under the condition that we would not cause any uh, disturbance. And indeed, that did not happen. Um, the second reason for that frequency is that, of course, it's very close to the uh, 50 megahertz burn band, where with some tweaking, you were able to uh, change the frequency slightly. So you will still manage to get that frequency without too many problems uh, after all. So we have that running already for many years. There have never been a complaint. And uh, I just got recently the license bill again, 130 euro, and that's it for a year. And nobody will ever ask questions again. That's all we had to do. Another big thing, well, much bigger in fact, is that the French put in a radar for, sorry, uh, this one. No, uh, sorry about that one. The graph radar is for detecting Space junk, let's say it. Uh, this, is a, this is a megawatt thing that you cannot hide that, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, amateurs all over you make very good use of that one. Just to pinpoint our beacons here in Belgium, Ostend, you might know on the other side of the channel, we have the UK, of course. Here is the beacon, the Ypres beacon in Flanders fields. And indeed, that's a place where they still find ammunition from the First World War. And the second beacon is, sorry, more in Ardennes Durbe, which is a geophysical uh, institute that's more tied to the uh, observatory in Brussels. Of course, we, we have links and they were jointly uh, decided to take these frequencies. Here's the man uh, who is the builder of that, Gaspar. Uh, well known in his radio shack. This is the transmitter, in fact, cooling fins and so forth. Uh, analog uh, technology working flawlessly for many years. We only got once a blown up electrolytic capacitor, and that's all what happens in all of these years. That's then the, transmit the transmitting antennas themselves, of course. Uh, you see it's not that far, in fact, from buildings uh, close to public observatory. Um, that's no issue uh, either because we are beaming upwards. So we, are, we are not beaming horizontally like they do with uh, FM or TV. No, we are beaming upwards. And this is the theoretical, of course, characteristic of the antenna uh, in that field. The dipole is a uh, one-eighth of a wavelength above the field and that's the, the the theoretical curve of course which all in all is is uh, i think is, uh, more or less correct that's the picture of the uh, french radar Rad, which is in the middle of france that's their beam um, it's a, a, a switching beam in fact there are beam four beams switching all the time um, you would say this goes to the south. Uh, that's no problem because the power and, and the residual power in all directions possible is, is much bigger than, than what you ever need. Um, also, at, at one of the latest uh, IMCs, we heard from the people who are running that, that they will definitely go on with that one till 2030 and maybe afterwards. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe they go to something at higher frequencies. 
but this was this is uh, for many years already something really uh, exceptional that we can use too. This is receiving antenna. This is my roof. My antenna is under the roof, so I'm not able to isolate it too well, or I don't have any signal anymore. Um, so why not uh, just inclined, of course, in the direction of the beam itself? Um, this is not my radio shack, but of one of our members. I think you all recognize it. Uh, what stuff is in there? Communications receiver. They have the PC with the spectrum. Uh, running and so on. Um, of course, you could use a communications receiver. I have a dedicated small receiver that was made in, in Japan for that frequency. But nowadays, I think uh, you can easily tune into any frequency that you like with a small software and a very cheap software defined radio like, like this one and I'm sure many other ones too. Now, this is only the start, of course, what we do now. We observe, we run a spectrum program like Spectrum Lab. There are several others. Um, time scale, five minutes, vertically a couple of hundred hertz for our frequency for the uh, 50 megahertz. And the well known things planes, planes all over, many planes. Uh, that don't disturb too much after all, because the meteors we are looking for are these sharp vertical uh, ones or these more complex ones when they are more powerful ones, the so-called underdense and the overdense ones. And you also see in my case here, from time to time when there are meteorological conditions, I also receive the carrier even at 150 kilometers from the beacon itself. Um, what to do with that? Well, many people put their hourly counts, the simple counts, on this web page, which I originally made, um, and together with Pierre Perrier, a Frenchman. Um, I like to zoom into that one live because there we can see which stations are running currently. Now, this is the beginning of the month. This is not a very interesting time, of course, because we have only a few days of observations and the rest is, is yeah, still blank. But some 40 yeah, stations worldwide post their observations. Let me look close to us here, of course. More in here. Um, right. Um, just, sorry, just a second. Um, that 38, I think, I think that's me, but there are already several stations uh, listening and reporting in the UK. You can look them up. You just click on the, uh, the number, you go to their observations and the location and all other details of which receiver and frequency is there. And like you see, most of them will be grave. It's grave all over, of course, for, for Europe. In the other ones, it can still be FM. Uh, so um, if you might be interested in some of these names, their coordinates are not, well, the coordinates are there, but not their email. Uh, I can try to bring you in contact with them, of course, uh, if they are uh, allowing for that. OK. Um, how do they put their results on that? This is by means of a program called Colorgram. I will also demonstrate that live. Um, this is not easy switching here to these programs. No, I, I won't be able because of my full screen size. But anyhow, uh, under the web links, you find uh, which program can you can use to automatically count your reflections. The software here is called HROFFT, Japanese one. Uh, personally, I don't use it. I found it a bit difficult and very sensitive to some settings. Still, like some others, I do count manually, uh, and you get very experienced in that. It does not take too much time. And you do see from time to time very interesting things. Uh, so um, that's what I do. But most others, of course, uh, 
do count automatically uh, with one of these programs. And they can still be improved, of course. OK, so a full screen like that uh, is, for instance, this one, a whole month from uh, somebody in, in the US. We see the typical pattern, of course, uh, with the maximum uh, around six local time. Um, this is in the month of October. And here you see not an outlier. This is an outburst of the draconids. That from uh, some years, the draconids have uh, these uh, outbursts. Um, also, this is the builder of our beacon, Gaspar, here with his call sign, with the call sign of the beacon. Also, he, for instance, uh, observed uh, the, sim the same thing. Uh, and another guy, Midas, in other words, also used the same thing. So when you have like three, four of them confirming that, then you can be sure that there's something going on. And of course, then you go more in detail what is going on. And then when you look down at the details, for instance, for five minutes, uh, so two stations here in, in Europe and then two in the US, then you can see that the, that pattern does repeat quite well. And of course, uh, some spread on it, but the general pattern is okay. You can even find sub peaks with some smoothing, but that of course the subject of some articles or presentations at the IMC. This one is a year long of observations from Felix Verbeelen of our beacon. Let me see now how well you know your streams. Who starts? January. January 3, January 4. Anybody? These are the quadrantids, also known as the boltids. Um, February, March, basically nothing, very little. What comes up in April, towards the end of April, we have the lyrids. Further on in May, the activity during the year, also in the morning hours, uh, increases, and we have the aquarids. And in June, we have these famous daytime streams of Hay and Stewart. And these streams, when you compare to the red, all other red here, these are the strongest and the longest lasting of the year. Of course, we don't see them in the southern hemisphere, but can see some of that during twilight. In July, of course, July and August, we have the, the, the better known streams during summertime with us, uh, Delta Quarits, uh, Capricorn, it's Perseus, of course, in the middle of August. September again, very little. October, Orionids can also vary a little bit from year to year. Who's, when we say November, we speak about the Leonids, 22nd or so, but here they are almost absent. Uh, the Leonid outbursts, of course, are well known, but the normal yearly activity is normally weak. And they have a very high velocity that also makes that they're not too good reflectors and we count less of them. And then what I consider the, the best stream of the year are in December, the Geminids. And a smaller one, circumpolar for us, can observe all day and night the Earth sits, but uh, also this one also has some outdoors. Sometimes you, like we saw that the draconids activity, that the draconids are of course known, but here um, during the very weak period of the year, which is like today, huh? February, February, March, um, there is something happening. And here on February 5th, we do see here a very strong signal for one or two hours and the same uh, here. This is on the VVS beacon, 50 megahertz. This is on Grav, so um, completely different setups and we do have the same one. So that is indeed something special um, to make it short. That one was seen by all European observers and North America, not in Asia, Far East, 
uh, which points uh, to the fact that the region there was below the horizon. Of course, you cannot compete with somebody like Peter Brown and his radar, which was also observing uh, the phenomena. Um, also, Peter Brown told us uh, at an IMC a couple of years later that this was one of the three new streams that uh, he also discovered in, in four years time with his radar. Um, when you see the, the counts, uh, the estimated visual ZHR is, is 50. That's quite, quite substantial. Of course, we hadn't seen it bad weather here with us. It was daytime. The radiant is, has a pretty high declination. So uh, that, that's good for us. Then we can observe most of the time. Um, the only thing we know is that it is a heli type of comet that's based on velocity and, and eccentricity. There was also activity in 2018. And how about tomorrow, 2022? Today, I haven't seen anything, but definitely we'll be watching out for tomorrow. And there might be another one. So these are these uh, exciting things from time to time. Most of the time, not that much is happening, but it's real and it can be detected. Just to come back uh, for about uh, the range where you can observe these beacons with the ones we have here we can easily go 400 to 500 kilometers of course if it's just a challenge we, we have the signal and we have very few meteors that's not very useful graph on the other hand can go as far as 1200 kilometers and the proof of that is here bill ward in scotland um, who has his Yagi horizontally and straight the direction of ground, has just excellent geometry results, 140 counts, pings call it per hour with the exact pattern. This is very good. This is uh, just excellent. So this can be used from almost all places in UK and, and throughout uh, Europe. Now, um, we have there these individual uh, graphs of counts, all made with different setups. What can you do with that? Is there anything more that can be done than just showing that picture? Um, I think I, I doubted it, but I'm proven wrong by these two Japanese guys, Ogawa and Sugimoto. They do attend, of course, the, these IMCs who, who did the following. They say we will monitor a stream. So it starts with the known uh, radiant uh, that we want to track. They choose a stream, the Geminids or the Persids, anything like that. And then they look at RMOB. Uh, they select all the observations for which the radiant elevation is not too low and not too high. Come back why that is. Um, First, of course, they deduct the sporadic activity, and next they correct for the radiant elevation. If you correct for a radiant elevation less than 20 degrees, you have the risk that you overcorrect with a factor maybe three or four because the radiant is too low. So you, you simply don't do that. And when the radiant elevation is higher than, say, 70 degrees, the reflections are too far away from you. And you will also miss many of the under dense uh, reflections. For instance, that's what we see. Uh, the jet, uh, the bursts uh, culminate almost in the zenith, and then the counts uh, fall back. Of course, that the stronger meteors are still there, but but in any case, it's a situation that you try to avoid uh, to compare streams. Okay, then they normalize that. Uh, the activity level, they call it, is zero, of course, when there is no stream activity. And it goes up uh, to level three or four. Um, this picture from the Geminides 2002-2016 of all kinds of stations is remarkably good. Uh, it's, it was unexpected to me that uh, asymmetric uh, pattern is right, is confirmed by also visually. 
and they can fit a nice so-called Lorentz profile to that. Uh, so that's definitely worth it. On their website, they have all the results for well the big streams, of course, from, from the past same period. This year, there was still an interesting one. This is may maybe a bit more difficult to see. Proceeds, where they start to track it. Normally, the maximum is so longitude even 140. But then uh, a day later came an outburst um, in their activity level. And they went even further. They have tried to correct that or to, to develop, a, call it a zenithal hourly rate for radio. ZHR, we know, of course, visually, that means that's the number of meters that the person will see uh, when the limiting magnitude is 6.5 and the radiant is in the zenith, which, of course, is very exceptional. Uh, you always have lower counts. But they managed to do something like that. They calibrated it with the sporadic rate in the March, in the month of February, March, and September, where they were also visually observing, and then they have something like a ZHR of the sporadic of yeah, ten per hour, let's say, and then they scale it to that one. In absolute terms, we can discuss that, of course. And the streams are not, are not all the same velocity. All true. But it's a fair indication, and when we compare that visually, it's OK. Also, that outburst with a ZHR of over 200 is more or less correct, uh, confirmed also by uh, visual observations. And the specialists, Peter Janiskens and uh, these people say, we did not forecast that one. It, is, uh, it was not predicted. They are honest about that one. So there are still things there to be discovered. We don't know everything about that. Uh, we can still monitor that and find very interesting things. Another topic, very, very different, individual uh, reflections. When you, some people are recording also the wave file, not just a, a spectrum and a picture for five minutes. They are recording the full signal that, of course, takes some disk space, but at that high rate. And when you then look at the detail from time to time, you have here a so-called head echo. This is not a reflection of the meteor. This is uh, on the meteor trail. This is That's the one where it starts. It's just before when the head still forms and reflects. And then you have the Doppler shift on that one. You have that descending tone. Um, of course, that slope uh, is related to the speed of the meteor. If it's a slow speed, then it will be flatter. And high speed, of course, it will be higher up. In principle, I say in principle, when you have this recording from three different locations of the same transmitter, let's say, uh, very accurately, you are able to find the complete trajectory, speed, and location from that one. Um, in reality, it's not so easy because there's still there's quite some noise about that, and the stations are not always well placed uh, geometrically. Uh, timing accuracy is not so good. Uh, if you have more than three, then of course it helps. You have some redundancy and you can find something. Uh, we have done some of that, but not to the full extent where it, it could be used. And far from all meters, of course, have had echoes. Right. Um, let's see if that one works. I'm showing here another one. Um, where's the pointer? It's gone for a while. But I can describe it like that. Uh, around second eight or so, you see some of these uh, also streaks. Here we are. One, two, three, four, five. And like 10 seconds later comes another one, which is a bit inclined, uh, less inclined. What is this? Is this, and here we have the signal itself. Is this is a disintegrating meteor? Let me see if. I can run the sound fragment. This works <laughs> normally not too well in presentations.
Sorry, Chris, we're not getting anything. Did you hear that one? Uh, no. No, sorry. That, that's in, well, that's uh, something to be uh, expected, unfortunately. You will get my full presentation, and that WAV file will be in there. You can definitely uh, hear that separately. But still, what is it? Uh, it turns out that it was the re-entry of a satellite, one of these uh, Starlink satellites, um, on January the 2nd. Oops, sorry, I have to go back this one. Yeah, that sounds. Uh, and here is the trajectory, the last passes of that satellite. And it was the very last one here close, of course, to us, where it entered uh, in our area and a bit further down. Of course, at a speed of, say, eight kilometers per second and 10 seconds in between, that's 80 kilometers already. That's quite a distance already horizontally in our neighborhood. So these ones also you can have from time to time. Combining radio and visual, um, well, here an all sky picture. Um, that's of course easy. Uh, this is at the place where our beacon is. That means that the second that the reflection is definitely not uh, taken at that place. This is from the second one, the second beacon there. Um, and this is the one I got. It lasted for about two minutes, so that's quite long. The visual trail, of course, has disappeared by then already for a long time. Um, what can you do with that? I don't know. Uh, because it is not directly related to, to the orbit of the meteor or the, or the part of the meteor itself. Of course, it's again so strong that it lasts, but it is maybe telling more about the upper atmosphere and how the trail expands than about the meteor itself, unfortunately for us, I would say. Now, this is about what I had to tell from the different uh, presentations in the past and knew that Paul was mentioning something about correlation visual and radio, I believe, but I have very little to say about that uh, because nobody or almost nobody is doing that. Um, people are just saying, okay, uh, radio meters are faint. This must be something like magnitude six or seven. And that, that's where it stops. Of course, we go uh, to very faint meteors. The big ones uh, are the overdense ones. But systematic correlations between that are not being done, in my knowledge, at this time. If somebody wants to tackle the subject, I think it's worthwhile doing, of course. But there, then I would say, then, uh, yeah. Just do it and uh, try something out, and we we discuss it. Uh, what's the best way to approach that? That's about what I got, and of course, feel free to ask any question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, are there any questions from any of the audience for uh, Chris this evening? Yes, I have, have one, uh, and uh, the question really is, you, you were talking about magnitude. Um, yeah. What are you uh, referring to? Um, well, I understand the normal optical uh, magnitude um, scale, but in radio uh, reflections, what, what, how does that relate? When you sit outside watching a, the sky and you see a meteor, you say, my the meteor I saw is magnitude three. That you would have to relate to the duration of the meteor. Not so much the intensity, the duration of a reflection, 
is a better measure of, call it the, yeah, the strength of a meteor. That's that goes back to the to the theory, of course. Uh, I can look up, but I have done this for this case. There are some studies about that. Some of that are very old and in the 60s still, like in McKinley. There are some of these. I can share that. I can look that up. Uh, how it's done. The correlation, all in all, is not very good. With that, I mean, if you have meters with the same duration, for instance, visually, they can be quite different. And from my own experience, I know, in fact, that sometimes you hear a meteor and you don't see anything, or you see a fairly bright meteor and you don't hear a thing. That has, of course, to do with that geometry. If that orientation of the trail is not right, it will not reflect like on the mirror, and there it's and you don't have it at all. For for stronger meteors, of course, uh, that does not apply that much uh, because they will uh, reflect not just along the line, but in call it like all directions. Thank you. Chris, there's a question come up on the chat from Sajid, um, and he's asking if you can explain more about the daytime stream. Yes, I can. Um, let me go back to the, I think the best one is this one. Okay. Um, well, um, Radio meters can be seen during daytime. They can be seen when it's clouded out. Uh, but optically, we will never know about them. It means that the radiant is too close to in the direction of the sun. And yeah, it's daytime when uh, they should appear. Maybe with some look, there's a very bright daylight fireball. But in June, in the month of June, there are like three streams. They're called the Ariapids and the Taurid stream. Um, and like, like it can be seen here, they, they are active for a very long time. And they're also very strong. When you strong, I mean a number of uh, reflections, like uh, if that's our measure. Um, so the only way to study them is by, by radio or by radar. And that's how the uh, orbits were derived um, and uh, found uh, to match. And I think there's one case that matches with a comet. Um, similarly, the et aquarids in early May and the Orionids are both from Comet Halley. The, Eta aquarids are a morning stream for us. In early May, the, the, the days are already much shorter here at our latitude. So uh, we don't see much of them. So this, this you could almost call a daytime stream. In the Southern Hemisphere, of course, there it's winter. They see a bit more about that. And I also mentioned that they see a little bit of the daytime streams also in the Southern Hemisphere in our June daytime streams. I want to add something more about that, not about the daytime streams, but about the weak activity in February and March. Um, how comes? Has that something to do with uh, the seasons or, or, or something like that? Uh, and is it different on the southern hemisphere? And the answer is no. This is something uh, non-uniform in the distribution of the sporadic meteors during the year. So in the solar system itself, it's uh, not all equally spread out during the, the year. Of course, streams are on top of the sporadic background. So the sporadic background February, March now is really low. It picks up more towards May, then it goes down and September is again a bit on the low side. Uh, but that's how it is in the solar system itself. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, Mike, Mike German, uh, can you unmute and give us I your question? Indeed. I have uh, indeed. Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Christian. Um, you, you mentioned about um, radio and visual uh, coincidences. And I, I'm uh, pleased to report that I'm getting some good results here. What in fact I do is I take the visual results from uh, U uh, UK Meteor Network and, I, uh, and they present the latitude and longitude for the tra trajectories of their meteors. Now I select my meteors where I've got a head echo. Mm -hmm. From the latitude and longitude, I can get the slant ranges of the meteor based on the position of uh, the transmitter and the receiver. And I can reconstruct a Doppler shift uh, from the um, uh, changing um, slant ranges for the visual. And if I match that to my uh, own head echo measurements, I can confirm it's a match or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something I've just started doing and I've got, um, say for the month of, uh, which I'm working on at the moment of November, I get about 40 matches of those, probably about 30, 40. Um, I, I select obviously, uh, ones that are a certain length, over dense ones, yeah. uh, longer ones. Uh, I'm using the Graves transmitter. Yeah. Uh, and I am uh, uh, um, ju just using the UK um, visual uh, uh, video recording. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a, I'm getting some quite good results. I'm working on the the maths of it at the moment, where I have, uh, uh, I'm having difficulty differentiating the uh, uh, changing uh, slant range, the rate of change of the slant, uh, because the time intervals are uneven, but I've, I'm working mm. on it. Sounds interesting. Yeah, uh, there is indeed so much material, also like the French uh, Fripon network puts out results. The emo fireball reporting puts out things, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for, for my technique, I really need the latitude and longitude, mm. and I'm not getting that from Fripon at the moment, okay, or mm. anyone else, just just on okay. the media networks. Then I would say, please, uh, looking forward to hear from that, or see you at one IMC, for instance, presenting that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting, Mike. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, if you if, if you've got any data, do share it on the um, on the forum or send John Cook um, a report for publication in the uh, Sky Notes uh, in, in the Sky News. Uh, that'd be very interesting to see the development of that. That's really good. Um, I've got a question here from Wit. Wit Reeves going to talk to us about something entirely different a bit later, but he says now, um, can you explain, Chris, um, solar longitude and how it relates to meteor observations? Solar longitude? Sorry, if I didn't get yes. that one. Yes. How does it relate to the meteor observations? That's the question from Wit. Well, solar longitude is is basically the time of the year, huh? Do we agree? Sure. Sure. Then I think that's the most relevant one we have here on the screen, of course. Um, if we have like 10, 15 annual streams, we have some others that are uh, having outbursts and some years that don't appear, like I said, like the Leonids. But it's more or less what I said about that absence or that low activity during the months of February and March. So there is here a shortage during the year and later uh, during the year. And I'm not considering the streams, of course, the activity, the sporadic activity picks up May, June, July. 
So there's not a one-to-one -one relation like a formula or a sine wave or something like that, that you could say there is uh, in the activity, the sporadic activity during the year. Uh, it's more complex. Uh, sporadic meteors are, of course, remnants of also comets and collisions, and the pattern is much more uh, complex than what we have here. We are, of course, looking on very short, short time scales of, of years, of, for instance. Some of the streams, like the Geminids, uh, have no long lifetime either. They might be, be only there around for a couple of hundred years and then disappear. Some other streams are known from records of thousand years ago. They are then in more stable orbits. Uh, the sporadics normally uh, we have them head on, of course, during the morning hours. And that's that picture where the car drives into the snow and you pick them up in the morning and in the evening, of course, they are behind you and they cannot catch up with you. So that more or less you recognize in here in the morning hours, they are bigger. In the afternoon hours, uh, local time, uh, then the activity is much lower. But that's explaining the daily pattern uh, and not so much the solar longitude. So there is no strict correlation with uh, saying perihelium of the Earth somewhere in January. There would be many more than in July. No, there's nothing like that. It is just random dust and uh, stones uh, spread out uh, through space. And this is the picture that we pick up. <laughs> You're showing a slide 15. On slide 18, you had solar longitude. Uh, ah. and is that largely a, uh, mm -hmm. a as if that is a uh, axis of time yes. increasing? Yes, of course. Let me, for some reason, I'm not able to skip. Can you show now. us 18? Yeah, yes. Um, I'm trying to do that, but my thing is locked up. Okay, 16, 17, 18. Uh, right. That is, in fact, that uh, that thing from the Japanese guys. Yes. Well, indeed, solar longitude, and on top of that is time in universal time. It is indeed the uh, equivalent to the time. Um, when we say the, uh, take for instance here. Solar longitude was 141 and a half. That corresponds, that just go up there to uh, 14th of um, August, say around six o'clock. Now, suppose next year, when will be that, uh, when will that be happening? It will be happening at the same solar longitude. That doesn't change. But, uh, the time will be six hours later because our year is 365.25 days, almost. And then the year thereafter, another six hours, and then another six hours, and then we correct by a leap day. So the time of the maxima from streams differs from year to year. If, for instance, we have got a very good maximum of the quadrantids in 2022. That is because they came just at the right moment. Uh, but a year later and a year earlier, we don't see them at the same, under the same conditions. Some, for some regions, they can be even below the horizon. So that's, where, that's why you will always find in, in literature, the maximum took place at longitude, solar longitude, so much degrees also indicating the equinox of 2000, uh, because in older literature, you might find 1950, that not so long ago that we got completely rid of that. And even before that, 1900. Um, so careful about comparing dates uh, when it comes to uh, outbursts of, of streams or maxima of stream. There can be up to one day different uh, between the four different years uh, into a leap cycle, so to say. 
So solar longitude is zero uh, on January 4th. That's the start of the Bessel year. Um, Another question, do metal rich meteors produce stronger reflections than those that are um, rich in um, stone in, 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 in the ceramic, like in the lighter elements? Do we know? I did not hear it. You were breaking up a bit, Paul. I oh, heard the question sorry. was, what which question, one are, yeah. The question is, do metal rich meteors produce stronger reflections than those that are stone rich. In other words, the, the, does yeah, the material... Yeah, yeah. The, the dependency is more about the velocity. Um, higher velocities, of course, burn up, so to say, higher up in the atmosphere, and the slower ones go deeper. Um, the regular meteors we are talking about, that these are grains and of, of a couple of millimeters. Sometimes you see them uh, also breaking up uh, um, in several parts. Most of the time they are gone in, in one bang and they are disappearing. I have to look that up. Um, when we are typically speaking about streams, uh, that's cometary material, that's not so much metal rich uh, material. So it's almost all stony and we not much of stream meteors will ever survive or will make it to the to the soil. Huh? They all uh, disintegrate. When we are talking about metal rich, we are more talking about yeah, uh, pieces of asteroids that uh, then reach uh, the earth. Um, there are, of course, the difference in composition, but it is more like magnesium or uh, potassium uh, things. For instance, the uh, quadrantids, botids, are related to asteroid Phaeton. And Phaeton has a very, and, and therefore the, sorry, the Geminids, I said that wrong, the Geminids are related to asteroid Phaeton, and they have a very close encounter uh, to, to the sun. Uh, and normally, uh, most of these volatile materials must be gone. And these are uh, normally potassium rich uh, meteors. That's something that we will see more in the spectra than I guess in our intensity of the streams uh, that we have. Here by coincidence, the Geminids are very strong, but that's intrinsically and not so much to do with composition in my opinion. Thank you. Do the optical observers do spectroscopy to determine composition? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, the name of Bill Port I gave, the Scottish guy, is a lot into that. And in some of the proceedings or in the uh, presentations of the IMCs, which are all available, you will find uh, things from him about that. Yes, also as amateurs with gratings, that happens, that, that gets done, yes. Um, there is no spectroscopic <laughs> commission or working group, however, because I think that's uh, part of the uh, video work. Also some on some of the WGN issues, they have sometimes a nice plate uh, cover of back, back, fo back photograph with uh, the composition, yes. Chris, um, unless there are any more questions, I think we'll draw a line under the first half. Are there any more questions before we give Chris our thanks? Chris, thank you very much for your time uh, in preparing for this evening and in, uh, and in presenting. Uh, that was a really good uh, presentation. In the normal course of events, we would be shouting and cheering and leaping on our feet <laughs> in appreciation, but um, that's just not possible in this era that we find ourselves. But um, yeah, you were appreciated, Chris, and, uh, and thanks again. That was good.
my pleasure and hope to see some of you in real life at the IMC. I will send you the complete uh, PowerPoint and that WAV file uh, I will send to Paul and he can share it with whoever he wants. Okay, you're happy for that to go up on our um, BAA RA section website? No, I don't have that. No, no. no we, we can post oh. it for oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. But that I cannot post happy. it. Yes, no problem with me. I, I, I thought you mentioned that I should post it there, but no, you will do that yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problem. Yeah. Good. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Right. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Tony to uh, share with us. He's been um, doing right. some observations and got some timely results. <laughs> Just in time, yes. Let me see if we can share anything. <clears throat> now, um, <laughs> ah, no, everything's disappeared. Ah, always a challenge. Oh, but <laughs> it's very good. I've actually completely lost the um, Zoom meeting and uh, everything's taken over. Stand by one. Oh, we can see you. Oh, you can still see me, right? Okay, that's good. Um, I've got to find the share my screen button. Where are oh, share screen, screen at the bottom? Yeah, there we go. So, with a bit of luck, uh, that should be that one. Can you see that? Yeah, that worked. Right. Well, this was a very short presentation, uh, not scientific, just uh, showing what the average amateur can do when he puts together a few things. Um, I actually presented some of this some um, uh, while ago, didn't I, in the middle of last year on regarding the magnetic uh, sensor, the flux gate sensor I'd put in the camera. But uh, this is the, uh, the optical side of things. So um, with a bit of luck, yeah, why? Oh, there we go. Uh, just wanted to talk about my camera that's on a pole looking at the sky and it's got a Raspberry Pi 3 and this uh, public domain software is available from Thomas Jackin et al on GitHub. And it's got an, a Raspberry Pi high quality camera with a 2.8 millimeter f1.2 lens that's pointing straight up. And it does uh, 30 seconds frame 30 second frames throughout the night and it creates time lapses star trails and um kiograms which is the um the, the sky brightness over the whole uh, the whole of the uh, time it's on during the night and then it also runs a web server so i can look at the uh, results through my wi-fi uh, and i think i showed this picture before this was on a table in the garden when I pulled it down. In, in fact, it was when I was installing the, um, the sensor, the uh, flux gate sensor, but you can see the, 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 the dome there, the, uh, the lens and the camera, and then there's a Raspberry Pi, and there's a bag here of uh, desiccant that uh, I stick in the box to stop it getting too uh, damp. It's touch wood, it seems to have been all right so far. I recently had some problems with it crashing a lot, and it turned out that um, this little um, DC DC converter that takes in 12 volts and produces five volts, it's got an um, inline USB cable uh, and it must have got some oxide on it. And I gave it a squirt of IPA and um, tightened up the springs a bit and it, it made a huge difference. It's not touch wood, it's, it's not crashed since. So uh, that's good increase the volts by about 0.2 or 0.3. That's still the sort of, uh, this is a single frame of what it sees, um, north at the top, uh, east at the left, west on the right and south at the bottom. And the uh, star trails look like this. And if it's a clear night and you get lots of nice star trails, you can also see if there's any meteors, but um, they're the, the, uh, as I said to Paul, I don't, I don't often see meteors. We've got quite a lot of light pollution and um, they really don't show up very well. But um, there was a, 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 tw a tweet from the uh, UK Meteor uh, Network a few days ago that said uh, January had been good for fireballs. 
So I looked at uh, one of the um, one of the times, and lo and behold, I found it. So let's just move on. Showing well, that's what a kiogram is showing hour by hour the central column of every um, photo. So you can see when the you know when you when you were clear and when the clouds came in, etc. Anyway, uh, UK Meteor Network reported this fireball uh, 7th of January 2022, but uh, it was actually at 21.29.52. And uh, obviously they, uh, the combined photographs of various observers manages to produce a, a picture uh, of where the track, uh, where the uh, event took place. And uh, we're in Leicester around here. So I thought, well, oh, I bet I can see this. Now this was a picture on the fireball, on the uh, on the on the meteor network page, and then this I looked I did I'd sort of ignored this uh, nighttime picture before because clouds were coming and going all along, uh, and there's the uh, the same uh, uh, fireball, uh, and you can see there's quite a bit of purple colour in it as well. So I was quite pleased to find that, and then I did the exercise for another of the events. Uh, which was shown on the um, on the network, and this was up one up by the wash, um, and uh, we can see it there. So again, uh, we were um, able to see the same thing. Obviously, I'm not part of any scientific network. I just uh, occasionally look at my photographs to see if there's anything interesting, and very occasionally we get some really nice pictures like. This with a lovely, um, lovely purple glow there. Uh, I haven't been able to correlate that with anything I could see on the uh, fireball, uh, the, the uh, meteor network. But there you are. Uh, you can see how much colour you can get with that. In fact, it showed a bit of chroma chromatic aberration of the lens, I think, as well there. And finally, um, end of last year, of course, um, Brian was testing the new uh, six metre beacon down south and I pointed my uh, six, me uh, six metre four element Yagi up at 45 degrees. And that was coupled into my uh, ICOM 7100 uh, of feeding the data into Spectrum Lab from which I got this. Um, there should be, a, that it wasn't operating this day, but that's the uh, meteor rate of the Geminids uh, at 50.398. So uh, I'm doing all these sort of observations, not correlating them, but uh, it's something we can all be doing, isn't it? And um, that is the end of my presentation, folks. That was good, Tony. Um, <laughs> yeah, well done. I mean, I'm always amazed at what we can do with pretty modest kit. Um, anybody got a question for Tony? Tony, a couple of slides back, you had colorful, but the slide before that in the bottom left had an interesting graphic. It was rotated. Well, yes. how come? Why? Yes. I don't know why. I found that on the new UK Meteor Network. For some reason, um, the guy had decided to twist it. I don't, I don't know why. I think it, 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 it was the same, um, the same uh, direction as some of the other pictures on the screen. So... <laughs> Of course, depending whether you're sort of north, south, east, or west of the of the track, uh, you're going to get different angles anyway. So, anyway, I thought it was a sort of interesting, and obviously he's um, he's delineated some of the stars that were visible in the. Um, it looks like a dragonfly as well, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe declination is up or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that looks like an All Sky 7 camera picture from their uh, yeah, yeah. global view. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so people are producing some fabulous pictures and, and moving images. You know, they, I, I don't, presumably the software um, enables you to uh, grab when you see a move, something moving. Uh, otherwise, if you're taking videos all night, there would be far too much storage. I don't know how it works, but uh, I say I'm just taking 30 second. Uh, I don't get the movie. I just get the 30 second uh, streak. But um, that was it in this particular case. And obviously the clouds were fast moving, which is why they're streaked as well. 
Anyway, it, it's it's if you, if any of you got spare Raspberry Pis, um, the Raspberry Pi HQ camera, I think it's only about fifty pounds or something, and uh, it's a CS mount lens. You can get uh, very cheap uh, fisheye lenses that fit them, um, and um, the software is very easy to run, install, and um, you can install a web server as well. And I mean, I'll. I'll I'll only show what I've got on the presentation, but I mean, I, I could browse my camera now if anybody was interested, but it'll probably get technical technical problems as we try and go to a live, um, a live view, but I, I will look at the website if you want. Um, so if I want to build, if I want to build one, where do I get a parts list or a web page? That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's on, if you search, um, GitHub for um, Thomas Jackin, J-A-C-Q-I-N. Um, the, the, the software for all that is there. There is also a Facebook group called All, all Sky Camera where we are answer each other's questions. In fact, um, uh, I had, a, I had a, a request from somebody uh, yesterday, I think it was, about my dew heater. I've got some... Um, some 10 ohm resistors in a, in a in a circle around the lens and um, they're controlled by uh, there's a one one wire thermometer um, which uh, let me just find it there we go yeah there's a one wire for there, there's the the, the uh, resistors around the camera uh, and there's a, a temperature sensor which is coupled into the uh, one wire bus of the Raspberry Pi, and I've got a bit of Python code that operates this relay. You can see here switches on and off these uh, these heaters depending on whether the camera is um, above or below uh, fifteen degrees centigrade, and that's um, that gets uh, that keeps the top of the dome all warm and drives off any 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 icing on the dome. Um, and um, there's various versions of that, uh, but I can I can I can send um, Paul some links if people want it. It's um, people are building them all the while, and um, it's quite a network developing as far as I make out. And uh, we say, "Oh, did you see this?" and uh, and then we all we all look at our pictures and say, "Oh, yes, I saw it." And you can see the angles are obviously different against the uh, star star background it's not science at the moment for me but um, of course it can easily be made into science good let me just close this down i knew how to there we go oh, yeah, no, that's not it so there on your picnic table uh is, yeah. <laughs> do we just not see the uh, spherical plastic dome over it? It's so uh, invisible for, for us, or what? Uh, well, it. Um, yeah. It. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, let me just go back to the. Because we see the camera, uh, I assume there's a dome protecting it. Yeah. Uh, oops. Can you see that still? We We're looking at build on the top. Yes, uh, we see a yeah. table on the left. Yeah, so the um, yeah, the, 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 this it, this is a dome held by the one, two, three, four, uh, eight, eight, eight screws, and that's um, that's um, a piece of um, rubber, sticky backed rubber, which uh, seems to seal it quite well. Uh, the dome came from eBay. Uh, the, the 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 rubber seal came from eBay. Um, the the waterproof box came from Amazon. Um, the DC DC converter came from eBay. Um, yeah, you know I didn't spend more than about a hundred pounds on the whole thing. I see a relay. How come? Well, that's that's what, yes. I mean, I, I suppose as an electronic engineer, I should be using a, an FET there, but that's the one that. Uh, that's the one that switches on the 12 volts to the heaters to the demisting heater. 
So there's a. Um, of course, thank you. Yeah, so there's a, a, a one wire um, temperature sensor, which I think you just see there, which is coupled into the uh, Raspberry Pi and uh, uh, just a simple on off, uh, on off thermal control. It just definitely keeps the dew off the, the dome quite well. Good. I'm going to stop sharing if I can find out where the stop share button is, but it seems to have disappeared. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's gone. Right. Um, thanks, Tony. That was that was really good. Um, now, moving away from uh, meteors, I'm going to ask um, Whit Reeve to share with us some new results that he's acquired. Okay. Uh, thanks, Paul. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and I can give you about 20 minutes if you wish. Um, I would like to just have a couple of minutes. Um, I have a few slides here. On, um, and these are some observations that I just made uh, just a few days ago. Um, there was a coronal mass ejection from the sun on uh, in late January, uh, January 29th. And when it impacted the Earth's magnetosphere, it caused a sudden frequency deviation. And that was on the 1st of February. And you should be able to see a garish green slide. And uh, let me know if you can see that okay. Yes, we can with it's beautiful. Okay, excellent. So here's, um, here's the observations. The upper plot is from my SAM-3 magnetometer. And what I've done is I've just plotted um, the time between 2218 UTC and 2238. So about 20 minutes of time. And you can see that there's a sudden impulse um, at 2020.41. And that course corresponds exactly with these sudden frequency deviations at 25 and 15 megahertz on the lower plot below. So the time span on this Argo plot uh, down below is um, pretty much the same as what's seen above. So you can see that the sudden impulse caused a few hertz, plus or minus maybe a couple hertz of deviation on 25 megahertz, and that's the WWV station in uh, Colorado. And um, it also caused a little blip, not much, um, on 15 megahertz, and that's either WWV in uh, Colorado or WWVH in Hawaii. Um, I wasn't listening to the audio at the time, so I couldn't identify it. It could possibly have been one or the other, or maybe even both. So um, what's interesting about this is that with this sudden impulse here, um, usually there's a little tiny dip just before it breaks and rises as shown here. But I, I, um, uh, I have a 10 second sampling period. And uh, if there is a dip there, it doesn't show up. But another unique thing about this observation is that usually sudden frequency deviations like you see down in the lower plot down below, um, usually they're caused by, uh, and by solar flares in almost real time. But in this case, it was a coronal mass ejection that uh, compressed the magnetosphere rapidly and altered the um, altitude of the ionosphere and thusly changed the path length of the propagation from Anchorage, um, uh, from uh, uh, Colorado up to Anchorage. And um, uh, the distance is pretty great. Uh, WWV in Colorado is about 3,800 kilometers from me and WWVH in Hawaii is about 4,400 kilometers. So those um, the propagation has to come a long ways before it gets to me. And uh, so it was the ionosphere somewhere in between that got compressed rapidly and caused, caused all this. So it's kind of an interesting setup. Um, the upper plot here shows my 
a magnetometer and some of the infrastructure that's required to keep everything running smoothly. And the lower one is my receiver setup. And I usually have three receivers running full time uh, on the same antenna. Um, but on the plot you see here, 20 megahertz should have shown up at 1,005 hertz on the Argo plot. And uh, the receiver had been mistuned and was off screen, so I didn't see it. Now, what you're actually seeing on the Argo plot is not the carrier, not the 25 or mega, uh, 15 megahertz carrier, but you're seeing um, the de demodulation of the carrier um, with the uh, the receiver is set in lower sideband mode and it's tuned one kilohertz above 25 or one kilohertz, approximately one kilohertz above 15. So you, what you're actually seeing is the demodulated carrier in, in lower sideband with a thousand hertz offset. And in, um, that, that's a nominal value. The actual offset for this, uh, the lower plot is 995 hertz, and for the upper plot is 1,015 hertz. So that's what I've got for, um, for that. And if we've got some time, Paul, I'll give you a quick rundown on a lunar radar experiment that we did at HARP here uh, in the middle of January. Yeah, we have time. Yeah, please continue. Okay, good. Let me um, let me reshare, and I'll use the bring up the harp uh, presentation here. Just a couple slides, and so this was a um, some transmissions that we made from the harp transmitter up at Gakona, Alaska. Uh, we pointed the array at the moon and transmitted about 2.3 megawatts of power. And then um, I recorded the uh, reception of that in Anchorage and Dave Topinski in Florida also recorded that. And here's a plot of Dave's results. Um, you can see the, the, uh, the transmitted pulse from the array up at the HARP facility. Here's the big pulse or the big signal. And then about 1.8 seconds uh, on the plot here, you see a, a much weaker one. And that's the return, the reflection from the moon. And this was, uh, the, the transmissions were done uh, using an FMCW mode so that uh, with a two second period. So the um, return pulses from the moon were um, actually overlapped the outgoing pulses uh, or the sweep from the, um, from the array at, at HARP. So if you do some uh, arithmetic, then you subtract the peak here of the return pulse from the, uh, the outgoing pulse here, you come up with uh, about, um, Oh, about almost 0.7 seconds. And that works out almost perfectly with the, the return that we expect from the moon. The actual uh, pulse going, uh, or the sweep signal going to the moon takes about 2.7 seconds to go all the way to the moon and back. And so when you uh, subtract out the two seconds, then you come up with the, the differences here. So Dave did some analysis on this and um, where he uh, took a look at the pass band of his receiver and uh, did some timing analysis and his calculations uh, came up with an error of about 116 kilometers um, measured from the outgoing sweep from HARP uh, to the moon and back to his receiver in Florida. And uh, to me, this is pretty amazing that uh, we have 0.03% error in our, in our uh, uh, simple radar that we do, we're using here. Now, HARP is not a simple system, but the receiving end of this was pretty simple. It was an R75 um, 
ICOM general coverage receiver and a simple dipole that he hung just for this, this experiment. And we've since done a little bit more math on this and uh, that error has increased a little bit. And now it's about 0 .0, uh, almost 0.05%, but that's still pretty remarkable, I think, for um, this kind of a setup. So that's pretty much um, uh, the lunar radar. This is uh, what I measured in Anchorage. So this is the spectra centered on 9.6 megahertz of the outgoing pulse going uh, from HARP into my receiver. And um, you can't see any reflections from the moon in Anchorage because my RFI is, is uh, my noise floor here in Anchorage is much too high. Now, this is um, a receiver that I had operating up at the uh, HARP site uh, um, about one, uh, three quarters of a kilometer from the transmitter. So you can see that the receiver was grossly overloaded. You can see uh, some uh, delayed, these dotted lines here on either side of the center frequency. And we think those are FM products uh, from the sweep um, uh, at the transmitter. Now, what's interesting about this one is this is a third receiver that I had set up down at Coho, which is about 125 kilometers south of Anchorage. And um, I don't know if you can see this, but you'll see kind of a red uh, slanted line here. That's the outgoing pulse going, uh, being received from the HARP facility. And then right above that, you'll see a very weak green uh, line. And that is uh, the reflections from the moon. At uh, I had my receiver tuned to uh, 9.608 megahertz, and uh, I was using the uh, upper sideband modulation mode. So um, that's uh, where I, I actually recorded this, and you could hear, and I don't have a recording in this presentation, but you could hear the, the uh, outgoing sweep. It, would, it was a chirp followed about six tenths of a second or seven tenths of a second later by a much weaker chirp. So it would go chirp, 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 chirp. And um, so this is some relatively simple setups that we had going. Um, you can see RFI over here on the left-hand side of this spectra. And uh, so that's something drifting through there. Could it be a power supply or something like that? Um, now I do see that I, I did embed this audio. I'm not sure you're gonna be able to hear this, but if you have headphones on, turn, turn up a little bit. If you've got speaker, turn it all the way up and let's see if we can, if we can hear anything here. So you, you, you should hear a, a chirp, 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 chirp. Is that coming through at all, Paul? Yeah, that's, that's really good. I could hear that very well. Oh, excellent, excellent. I, I was worried that it would be too weak uh, for you to actually hear it, but uh, let's listen to that again. I have it in a loop. You need a bit of volume. And what's interesting about um, this site here at Coho um, is that I went through the, the, the transmissions lasted for about one and a half hours. And I only, uh, at Coho, I only received maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen uh, return sweeps from the moon. So um, the propagation conditions weren't perfect uh, by far, but um, at least I could receive something that, that sounded correct. And um, um, at Coho, I was using an LWA antenna, a single antenna with uh, its uh, circular polarized. And I happened to be on the right-hand polarization side of the antenna. And I'm still working out whether or not that was the correct polarization for 
the outgoing and return pulses from HARP. Uh, they were sent right hand polarization out from HARP. And uh, we still haven't worked out whether or not they reverse polarized on reflection or not. So I, um, but at least we got something out of it and uh, have some, some interesting, some interesting plots. Now there was another fellow in Arizona, Arizona, that um, was listening in, and he uh, recorded with his, with his cell phone uh, the display on one of his transceivers that he had set up. So let's play that. It should reverse with. What's that? It should reverse very definitely. Yeah, I'm not getting any audio. I'll play that again. His, um, um, his setup in Arizona, uh, it was pretty weak, but I, um, you could very definitely hear um, the chirp followed about six, seven tenths of a second later by the weaker pulse. So um, there were, these are the only two sites other than my own that I know of that were actually uh, looking at this in any kind of detail. So uh, very successful experiment. And um, I recorded all of the uh, data on all of these, uh, my three receivers, one at Harp, one in Anchorage, and one in Coho. And I have about 50 plus gigabytes of IQ data uh, that I'm sending up to the uh, the principal investigator on the on the actual project. So hopefully uh, we'll get something that'll come out of this uh, for future use. So Paul, that's pretty much uh, all that I've got to report from Anchorage. Sorry, I took longer than I actually, I only intended to spend about two minutes, but I ended up spending 10. Sorry about that. No, that's, that's fine. Very, um, very interesting. Um, does anybody have any question or comment for Wit? Wit on that slide with Coho. Uh, can you explain the diagonals? Uh, sure, the red one is the transmitted, and then we get a blip, probably, but they're interleaved actually too. Uh, but I was, I could see a, a, I guess an angle simply because it's a chirp, so you're changing frequency, but the scale seems wrong. Um, the, the, the sweep length or the sweep um, frequency is plus or minus 15 kilohertz from the center frequency. The center frequency was 9.6. And uh, so we uh, swept 30 kilohertz, or I'm mean, sorry, 15 kilohertz on each side of that. We start at something lower than 9.6, sweep 30 kilohertz. Um, and then start all over again. So that's the red line that you see there is the outgoing. And then the, the return, um, all I can see on the coho plot is uh, maybe, oh, roughly 10 kilohertz of that return sweep. I don't see the entire 30 kilohertz um, FM sweep. I only see about the upper 10 kilohertz or so. I guess I'm confused because on the audio, it was must have been a much short, uh, smaller bandwidth. And so therefore the, the oh, time- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what Much shorter. And yeah, so that makes right. sense, okay. Um, look, look up here at the very top of the plot, you see this little green bar? Okay, that is the pass band of the, uh, of the upper side band filter that this is going through. So all of your, all you're hearing is the squeak of uh, that two and a half kilohertz passband of the of the USB filter. 
and and yet it was transmitting a much longer time that's what was confusing me thank you yeah yeah it, it, it trans transmitted it's the the sweep required two seconds um and it repeated you know for one and a half hours but what i'm what i uh what you heard in the audio recording is just um what came through the upper sideband filter of uh, you know roughly two two and a half kilohertz wide With your cursor, can you show us a transmitted and then reflected? Because I think they're interleaved. Okay, this red trace, weak red trace that you see here, that's the transmitted. And and it's reflected would be uh, the second green up? Yeah, the, the green that's just right above it. So but here you have a trans That's too short a time, so, so isn't the, it? The way this is worth the way that because of the timing, uh, going to the moon and back takes about 2.6, 2.7 seconds. So this sweep here would be the outgoing. This sweep up here would be the reflection from that outgoing sweep because they're overlapping by two seconds. And this. This uh, reflected pulse that you see here, it ori originated down, down here. Does that answer your question? Perfect, thank you. Okay, good. Any more questions? Just a quick comment. Um, Wick, thanks for the presentation, that, that was great. Um, the, if you're using circular polarization, it's reversed on reflection from the moon. The convention is to use right-hand circular polarization on transmit and left-hand circular polarization on receive. Um, and, and the question, uh, what frequency is hot on? Uh, the, the transmissions were on 9.6 megahertz. And that's the question that we've, we're trying to confirm. We know that UHF and VHF, that their polarization is reversed on reflection from the moon. But we don't, I guess we don't really know that for sure yet, if that applies at lower frequencies, longer wavelengths. Okay, thanks. Oh, it has to, but... Well, I yeah, I agree with that. And uh, what we <laughs> I wanna... don't understand. I don't understand why it wouldn't. Yeah, I I don't either. But um, we don't want to say that until we can we can prove it. I guess. I I will I will invoke Mr. Maxwell on that. Dr. Maxwell knows quite well that it'll reverse. Yeah, that's why that's what we're doing right now. Okay. Sounds, sounds good to me. Uh, this morning, um, I got some echoes off the moon on 10 gigahertz, but I was using linear polarization to keep it simple. At 10, at 10 gigahertz or 10 megahertz? Uh, 10, 10, 10 gigahertz, three centimeters. Yeah, 10, 10 gigahertz. Okay. Yeah, these, these uh, we're using um, almost 10 megahertz. So uh, much lower than that, and uh, in fact, it was very close to the to the upper limit of the HARP array transmitter, uh, the ionospheric research instrument transmitter. Uh, the upper frequency is ten megahertz on that guy, so we were pretty close to the edge. And uh, Dave and I are writing all this up, and um, uh, I'm not sure if it'll get in the Sarah journal for this uh, coming issue at the end of February, but it'll be, uh, we are planning to put that in the Sarah journal. Great, thanks. Uh, will the HARP experiment be uh, repeated, please? What, uh, could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, will the uh, HARP uh, moon bounce uh, experiment be repeated? Oh, um, yes, I hope so. Uh, but we don't have any dates or any um, even preliminary plans for that yet. But yes, I hope it does. 
and when and when it does or if it does i'll be ready with receivers on both polarizations of my lwa antennas that i have at harp and uh, down at coho so i'll be ready for it when when it happens it won't be um it it may not be on, if it does happen at all, it may not be until later part of this year or maybe even next year. Thank you, Rick. Um, do keep us posted as to the um, further developments of this piece of research as and when, um, yeah, certainly as and when the uh, experiments repeated. And yeah, and Paul, I'm I'm trying to um, keep the uh, the Sarah email list. So if you're a Sarah member, you uh, and you monitor their email yes. list. I, I try to make the announcements on that, and um, I can also do that for uh, on your email the the group's IO. So if you if you want me to to keep you guys up to date directly, I can do that too. That would be helpful because not everybody on Groups IO is on the Sarah forum, um, although, right. I, although I am, so I might repost if I see it. Okay, good, I, I will do that. Mm, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and back to you, Paul, thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for sharing, Reeve. That was, that was just so good. Um, Okay, I think that concludes the evening for uh, for tonight. Next month, we've got David uh, Hooper, Dr. Hooper with us um, from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, and he'll be talking about um, polar mesospheric summer echoes along with um, other stuff, I'm sure. So um, from me, it's good night and see you again. Good night, everybody. Paul, Paul before you close it down, did yes, you yes. see I've just... I've just put on the chat box, I put the link to the uh, All Sky camera on GitHub. So, uh, yes, um, you might want to save the chat. I, I, yes, I, I, I had forgotten to say, but um, if you save the chat, there are some links in there that might be useful as follow up from this evening's um, uh, the discussions. I'll just do it myself. All that disappears once the meeting's closed. <coughs> anyway, thanks everyone. That was good. Uh, yeah, it was very good. Very good. Good night, one and all. Good Thank luck with the snow night. clearing, uh, Wit. Yeah, it's snowing out there right now again. So <laughs> I'll be out with the shovel. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. Bye bye. Nice seeing you, Don.